As Peter said, my name is Liesl. I'm sure you've read the intro over there. I'm what's called a serial entrepreneur. So I start companies and then I do stuff with them. So when I was in my 20s, um, I had small kids and a, a non-working ex-husband. Um, so I was a breadwinner and I started a franchise. And I took it to 38 branches in four countries with about 80 staff and about 4,000 registered students. That was cool. Um, I brought it out to Australia and I realized technology was going to become important. So um, I thought, mm, I can either go back to uni and study IT or I can sell my house and sell my business and start a, a software company, which I did. Um, I decided that search engines were going to be important. This was back when people were saying, didn't you know the internet's dead? This was right after the tech crash, which I thought was a fantastic time to start a tech company um, because, you know, people just fall over and give up on stuff. And if you keep going and you hold a vision, you can do something valuable. Um, and the other thing I heard a lot was, we've already got AltaVista. We don't need any more search engines in the world. So that was interesting. Um, so I built a search engine company, listed that on the Australian Stock Exchange in 2005. And then I started another company um, called My Cyber Twin. We build virtual human beings like Siri on the iPhone. Um, but we were doing it five years ago. So we've got some pretty big customers. And um, yeah, it's going really well. Um, I've raised about $9 million into small um, entrepreneurial things and it's not because it's IT, it's easier than what we're doing here. You know, these were both in crashes. The one was in the financial crisis and the tech crash was brutal. Um, I've raised about $20 million altogether if, if you count the stock exchange listing. And I didn't know anything about software when I went in. So, what's the secret? Um, I'm also a Telstra Businesswoman of the Year finalist, which I'm excited about because next week I'll find out if I made it or not. So I can only say that for today <laughs> um, and, and we'll see how we go next week. So I think the key thing, and I can start talking to you about structure and where to raise money and blah, 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 blah. But for me, the biggest lesson was around creative visualization. Okay, the journey started for me, um, my first business, um, I found building stuff out of nothing, quite stressful and frustrating because you don't really know where it's going to go and how it's going to turn out. Um, but when I, the real kicker for me was when I started my franchise, I just had this vision. Um, I was actually sitting in the ladies room looking at a magazine and I had this competitor who had 36 branches and I went, I'm going to have 37. And it just locked itself in my head. And the weirdest thing happened. Two years later, I had 38 branches. Okay, now just to give you an example, my head held this as so real that the world had no choice but to come along. Now, what, I'm going to tell you the story in about five or six different ways, but that's it. Whatever it is you want to do, whatever your vision is, you know that Buddhist idea that thought becomes form? That's the secret. It's not how you do it, where you go for money, do you go to local government, do you go here, do you go where? That vision, that idea you have is reality. And if you hold it true enough, You'll find yourself a year from now looking around and other people will be following you and it will have started to come together and take on form. Let me give you an example of, of where this happened for me. I was in um, South Africa, I'm originally Zimbabwean, grew up in the war there and um, I knew I was moving to Australia and I had to, um, we couldn't take money out so you have to go on holiday with cash stuffed in your jackets and shoes and stuff. <laughs> And I knew, that, um, I knew that I added five franchises every quarter to my business and I knew that I'd been away for a month so I booked up tens of thousands of dollars worth of advertising. So um, I come to Australia, put some cash in the bank, go back to Africa and my phones didn't work. So it's just after the Somali massacres, thousands and thousands of desperate people were just walking for months to get down to South Africa and they got there and there was no work so they were digging up copper cables and selling it for scrap metal. Um, the cables weren't even overhead, they couldn't even do that. Government buried it meters under the ground, it's being dug up. So I had no phone and it rained for, th for like 30 days. So there was nobody repairing anything. And the interesting thing for me was that I'd visualized that I was going to have five new branches that quarter and it just wasn't happening. And more than anything, I was kind of puzzled because it, it was going to happen and I knew it and I just knew it. So two weeks before the quarter ended, I still had no phone. They couldn't even transfer phone calls to my mobile because it was an old analog system. I tell you, things really work here in Australia, you guys. You know, <laughs> we, we complain a lot, but everything works here. So what happened is, I remember, I just felt, I thought this is odd because it always happens. And um, 
what I did is I actually paid someone to string copper wire through my trees and hook it all up for me. And about two weeks before my deadline, a, a customer walked into one of my classes and said, oh, you should go on this primetime TV show called Your Own Business. I went, cool, I'll do that. So I called them up and they said, oh no, you're too small. We've done an education store already. Not interested, go away, forget it. So five days later, I thought, I'm gonna call them again. <laughs> so I called them again. And what happened is the woman who rejected me the week before was sick. Her replacement was frantic. She was right on deadline and didn't have her material together. This was like 7.30 at night, main TV channel. She said, I want to do the story, but can we be there in two hours with cameras and can you have 12 mothers and kids there? And I said, yes. <laughs> um, next day, I was on national TV. I had 200 and something franchise queries in the first hour. I had 150 the next day. I cherry picked the top 20, selected down to five, made targets. Okay, now I'm not saying this to sort of say that there's anything special about what I did. But after that particular episode, I thought there's, there's something very strange about this. You know, you look at people like Richard Branson and people who do great things in the world. And I think that is what's common about them. That vision they held is so pure and so true. Um, um, Steve Jobs is a classic example. People talk about his reality distortion field. That he'd walk in a room and say, we're going to do this and this and this and this. Everyone would go, yeah, yeah. They'd walk out, they go, hold on, there's no technology to do this. You know, it doesn't work. We, can't, we don't have the tools for it. But it, it became reality. So I started really puzzling about the mechanism for this, because I've got a, a psychology background. My degree was in that. And I used to think it was some magical energy transference thing, you know, put energy out to the universe, it comes back. But I reckon it's as simple as there's a, a thing called cognitive dissonance, which is that we don't like a state of imbalance in our heads. Okay? I'll tell you about the academic studies around dissonance. This is not about fundraising, but really it is. Um, because what I'm trying to illustrate is that when you've got that vision, things come together. And it's not always in the way you're going to expect. So, you know, you might be in a pattern of funk where you're always going to local government and trying to get, you know, five grand for this. And you could be spinning a half a million dollar deal with Woolworths for something you want to do. Okay. So, back to the mechanism of dissonance. Um, there was a, a study at a um, psychology department and what they did is they took um, all the first year uni students and they tested them on very deep fundamental belief structures. We're talking about political persuasion, your stance on abortion, you know, really, really deep things. And that they scored them for their values and attitudes around this. And then half a year later, so that the students did not realize this was part of the same study, they were forced to debate either for or against their fundamental belief system. And they were told that it was a big, important part of their year mark. And then at the end of the year, they re retested them for beliefs. And guess what happened to the people who had to debate against their belief structure? Belief structure changed. Something that you think is deep and underlying. So the mechanism is called dissonance. If there's an external reality and an internal mental state and they don't match, something's got to give. Okay, so in the case of these students, they couldn't change the external reality. They had to debate the opposite way. So their belief structure changed. Now, if you walk around with your head believing that reality is this is so hard and local government's so terrible and the world's never going to hear what we're trying to do and why doesn't everyone wake up, guess what's going to happen? That's going to become the story of your life. If you walk around thinking, believing, immersing yourself in the emotion as if it's already happened, it's a bit of a scarier place to be in because you're living in this spaced out reality that's kind of not real, but you hold it. And what happens is your subconscious comes to play and you come up with ways to do things. Okay, so that's the mechanism. I hold the reality in my head and I wake up in the morning and go, you know, I haven't spoken to so-and-so for a long time. I'm going to call him. And why don't I do this? And why don't I approach this company to do this? So that's it. So I can go into vast detail about different places. You can go for funding and business planning and blah, blah, blah. But to me, that's the key mechanism. Once I worked this out, I did it again with the um, search engine company right in the tech crash. I decided it was going to be a $20 million company. Everyone said, you're mad. You're a teacher. You know nothing about software. There's a tech crash. Didn't you know? The internet's dead. And um, when I listed it, it listed at a 23 million valuation. Um, the company I'm running now, slightly different targets. Um, with the, the last one, I forgot to put my own personal net worth in there. So the company <laughs> reached that value and everyone else made lots of money. Um, this one is lot, a lot more about um, 
you know, who I want to be as a human being and the impact I want to have in the world. So I think that's the key message I want to give you guys today. Um, you know, whatever your vision is, make sure it's something that um, is not too big that you don't quite believe it, but is not too small either. And then believe that people in the world are kind of lost and they love somebody with a clear story and a clear idea of where they're going, where the world's going. And they will come along for the ride. Um, now, that's 15 minutes. But what I thought I might do is maybe just have questions. I didn't prepare a talk because, as, as Peter said, I've been on planes and things. That was kind of it. Um, but I can talk to you about different funding mechanisms. You can chuck ideas at me and we can brainstorm some ways we can raise money into it. Um, I'll tell you one more thing, though. Um, I, I hang out in the entrepreneurial communities in Sydney quite a lot and overseas quite a lot. And I'll often get um, company founders coming to me and saying, oh, Liesl, I need to raise some money. I need to get investors. I'll give you an example. One guy came to me. He was a pretty senior guy. He used to be um, head of strategy for Fairfax, <coughs> doing all their mergers and acquisitions. And he decided to go off and start the startup. And it was a sports social network for sporting clubs. He goes, oh, Liesl, you've raised money. How do I raise money? I said, well, what are you doing? And he explained it. He said, there's these clubs. You know, when, when you're trying to organize soccer games and everyone's sending emails to each other and it's all messy, I said, what's your model for making money that's sustainable? He says, oh, well, you know, that we're going to get advertising sponsorship and, and so forth. I said, have you got any clubs signed up? No, I need to raise money first. I said, okay. So he said, how do I raise money? I said, well, don't. Go get some customers. You've got enough in place already to go and start earning money out of what you're doing. Then go raise your money. No, but how do I raise money? I said, don't. Nobody's going to put money into something if they can't see and touch and feel how it works. So you can't wait till these mythical investors or money comes in. If that vision's in your head, it's going to happen. Whether you raise $10 or a million dollars, you just start powering towards it. He failed, as many do, and I kept trying to get that message to him. Often, the way you get there is not how you thought it was going to happen. It comes out of some weird subconscious left field plan and it still happens. Um, when I first walked into Transition Sydney, I, I thought, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for this to become a sustainable entity in terms of the revenue it actually generates. You know, we're, we're fighting against enormous inertia and ignorance, and it takes money to address that. We need like a 50 grand a, year, a, a month PR firm that's slick as, you know, Commonwealth Bank spends 50 grand a month on PR. We need someone like that. Wouldn't it be cool if we had that kind of money to do that sort of thing, get the message out in a crispy donkin in their heads so they can't not hear what's going on way, which is not our specialty. People do this. Wouldn't it be cool if we could sponsor huge events? Wouldn't it be cool if we could, you know, buy land, take over stuff, you know, buy up all those freaking farms that are turning into Mac mansions and, and, and do something for, for our city? And there's ways we can do this. Another quick example. Can I keep going, Peter? I'm just rolling. One minute. Okay. So, you know, just for example, one thing I was exploring when I first got involved in transition is a crowd up in Queensland. I think they're a little bit self-motivated, but what they've done is they've gone, hmm, Gold Coast is not sustainable. Gosh, peak oil's coming. Gosh, what are we going to do about this? And they basically put together this beautiful structure. They've, they've gone and invented this idea where they've wandered around and they've got um, a, a corporate structure set up. They've gone and bought a huge, massive acreage organic farm. They don't actually have the money for it, okay? But they've got the idea. And then what they did is they, they, they set it up so that they could sell options in being part of this one day. So they've got thousands of yuppies in, in Gold Coast, spent four or five grand each, they've chucked it into this entity. And in return, the yuppies get the privilege of one day when this farm's working, they get to buy vegetables delivered to their door. And um, the company's retaining a big chunk of it, and they're going to list it on the stock exchange and roll out more of them. It was created out of nothing. They've got this land. They didn't put any money down. They, it was a codependency. Same as if you want a community garden and you've got your hand stuck out to local council going, money, 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 and you're waiting and waiting. Go to a school. Go to Woolworths. Go to BP, the enemy. You know, pretend that it's happened already. Go to the community. <laughs> Here he is, he offered. <laughs> well, we, we can erode that 13% ROI, you know, grow vegetables. <laughs> yeah, but the, the, the thing is not waiting for one thing to happen, then another. It's going to happen, and you pull people along for your ride. And that's how you do it. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>